Hello and welcome everybody to our second uh, town hall on the high season seabed mining. It's a delight to uh, welcome all of you here today and hope you're all uh, staying safe given the current um, uh, context. Um, in our first uh, town hall with Sylvia Earl and Liz Taylor, we heard a lot about uh, the activities around the high seas and the science around the high seas, particularly around seabed mining. Um, it's a new industrial activity that's opening up on the high seas, um, and it's important that we understand the implications of uh, the, uh, the, this, this activity on the environment. In today's town hall, um, we're going to explore a little bit about the regulations and institutional context uh, and how uh, seabed mining is being governed and being looked at. And uh, in our third town hall, we'll explore a little bit ar more around the uh, economics and the resources uh, for seabed mining and uh, why certain companies believe that we should be exploring uh, these resources. So I'm absolutely delighted to welcome two uh, international experts to um, this town hall. And in a moment, I'll, I'll bring them on. So Christina Gerde and, and Lisa Speer. But first, let me give you a little bit of context about the uh, themes that we'll be exploring in today's discussion with Lisa and, and Christina. So first, we'll be exploring the high seas. The, the high seas are these, this area in blue highlighted in this map that covers 45% of the world's surface. Uh, over 60% of the world's living area, if you take the, the depth as well. Uh, the green areas are the 200 nautical miles uh, from the coast that belongs to uh, sovereign territories to different countries. But the high seas are the areas that are beyond any one country's jurisdiction. And often it's within the United Nations where a legal framework has been created. Uh, one of the big developments in the last 40 years has been the 1982 uh, Law of the Seas. And in the 1982 Law of the Sea, that created a framework for a range of institutions. And just to show how complex the governance of our high seas are, here's a small uh, overview. Um, here's a small overview on the, um, oops, sorry. Here's a small overview of the map. Sorry, this was the, uh, the map of the high seas. And in blue, this is where the, uh, the territories are. And the green is within the national waters. But the blue is the high seas. And uh, this is the institutional uh, landscape um, that we see governing the high seas. We have a range of United Nations bodies covering everything from um, mining with the International Seabed Authority, which we'll talk about in a moment, the Food and Agricultural Organization that covers fish stocks and protected areas, United Nations Environment Program, uh, within which there is the Convention of Biodiversity and some regional seas programs, the UN Development Program, uh, looking at development around coastal areas, UNESCO, that's looking at some of the ocean science, the IMO, that's an ILO looking at uh, shipping and, and regulation of um, sailors uh, and, and safety conditions. And these bodies at the bottom, you know, the International Whaling Commission, the Arctic Council, Antarctic Treaty System that are uh, groups of countries that have agreed a various framework. And at, at the same time, we are in discussions around creating a new treaty called the BBNJ, Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction, which we'll explore in today's webinar. So, so this is the range of institutions uh, that govern our oceans. It's a complex uh, set of institutions um, to look at. And so uh, I think we would now like to welcome uh, Lisa Speer and Christina Gerde um, to walk us through some of the implications. So Lisa, welcome. Uh, Lisa is the director of the International Oceans Program at the NRDC, a marine scientist who's got a very long uh, and distinguished career testifying be before the US Congress, the United Nations on, on various high seas and, and Arctic topics. And uh, so welcome, Lisa. Thank you. And Christina Gerde, who um, is the uh, main advisor on the high seas policy to the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Uh, on the global marine and, and Arctic programs. And she's had many distinguished leadership roles in building um, very um, prestigious coalitions around the high seas. So Christina, welcome. So delighted to have you both. Uh, maybe I could start by asking Christina, maybe you can start by sharing a little bit about what you're seeing in terms of the themes um, in, in, in international policy around the oceans and high seas. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of initiative like the Sustainable Development Goals, the Paris Agreement that talks about an ocean track, the UNESCO Decade of Ocean Science. So maybe you could give a little bit of context on how oceans fit into that, that landscape. Well, as all of you probably know, the 
year 2020 was supposed to be the super year for the ocean. That's we finally made it onto the international agenda. That's uh, not only at the United Nations, where we've been talking about this new international legal agreement for marine biodiversity beyond national jurisdictions since I won't say I've been involved since 2002. Uh, that was, but uh, we've also been going um, to the negotiations at the International Seabed Authority, where they're trying to develop regulations to authorize um, the beginning of exploitation of deep seabed mining. At the same time, the Convention on Biological Diversity is looking at the expiration of its targets in 2020 for achieving life in harmony with nature and sustainable, true sustainable development. Um, and where do we go next? And so there's a lot of questions about what will be the future of our planet and a very large role for what is the future of our ocean. Terrific, thank you. And Lisa, as we see this elevated roles of ocean in these international policy concepts, from, from your role at NRDC and discussions with the United Nations, how have you seen ocean topics um, you know, relative to others? And what are some of the themes within ocean topics that folks are mainly focused on? And what have we learned now that we did not know even 10 years or 20 years ago? Yeah, well, it's a great question. And uh, thank you, Nishan. So just stepping back for a moment, I think the awareness of the oceans and the challenges that the ocean faces is has bubbled to the surface in, in, a, in ways that we haven't really seen before. So starting with the UN report last year on biodiversity, which found that more than a million species are threatened with extinction over the next 20 to 30 years. Um, many of those are in the ocean. The IPCC report on the ocean came out in September. That was written by um, the uh, scientists that make up the IPCC. And it's been a drumbeat of bad news for the ocean. And stepping back and looking at the plethora of stresses, it really does point to the urgency of this super year for the ocean. Uh, the, we have driven fish stocks around the world to levels of depletion we've never seen before. There's um, massive dead zones, nutrient pollution, plastic pollution, chemical pollution, noise pollution, and then on, you know, in addition to uh, a whole range of other impacts related to climate change that were documented in the IPCC report. So the, you know, the ocean, as, as most of people know, has absorbed about 90% of the heat that has been generated by burning fossil fuels, and also about a quarter of the, CO, the carbon dioxide uh, generated by fossil fuel burning, and that has had tremendous impacts on, on our ocean. And so the urgency for acting has, has really come to the fore, and I think this ocean super year is, remains an opportunity for us to make progress, even though the formal meetings are not happening that Christina outlined. There's still a lot that can be done and momentum needs to keep moving forward. Perfect. And, and Lisa, can you just expand a little bit what you mean by the super year for the ocean? What was the intent of uh, this year before you know, coronavirus hit us? <laughs> So um, as Christina laid out, there were a series of oceans, large ocean international meetings, I think that reflected the growing understanding of the need for international action to address the multiple stressors on the ocean. And so there was the UN Ocean Conference, which was supposed to begin next week, the Conference on Biological Diversity that Christina mentioned to set new targets for conservation was supposed to happen in October. The UN Biodiversity Summit, which is supposed to happen in September, probably won't happen. So a whole series of meetings that I think, again, reflect the, 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 a convergence of opinion among policymakers, academics, scientists, NGOs from around the world that the time for action is really now. Terrific. And so, Christina, in a moment, I'll ask you to share, uh, talk a little bit about um, one of these institutions that we're talking through today. I think um, I understand that the previous slide um, did not show, so hopefully you can see this now. Um, but so what we're talking about is going to be mainly around the high seas. So here in blue is the high seas that we will be talking about, and that's um, some of the summits that Lisa had just mentioned. So, so Christina, um, one of the big um, decisions this year will be taken by the International Seabed Authority, um, which is this institution um, over here, 
within this larger landscape. And they're going to be taking some decisions on whether to allow commercial seabed mining moving from uh, exploration to exploitation. Could you give a little bit of context on who are the international, who is the International Seabed Authority? Why were they created? Um, and a little bit about the uh, implications of this decision that they're about to take. Well, thank you. And let me back up a little bit to 1982, in fact, when the world um, negotiated and concluded the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. The revolutionary part of this UN Convention was that it designated the seabed area beyond national jurisdiction and its mineral resources as the common heritage of mankind. This means it belongs to no one, but is the responsibility of the state's parties to the Law of the Sea Convention to manage on behalf of humankind as a whole. This conveys a sort of trusteeship responsibility on these states attending these meetings to operate in business unusual in many times. Many times we're just driven by short-term self-interest. And this is supposed to be setting the framework that's going to pr be providing capacity building to developing countries, a source of revenue to developing countries, scientific research that we all benefit from, as well as access to new minerals. But... Um, what we didn't know back 40 years ago is that the seafloor that was assumed to be dark, distant, and basically dead is in fact an oasis of life. It's an oasis of everything that lives atop the mineral resources that we're now interested in. The manganese nodules themselves provide habitat for little octopuses. Um, and the, man the hydrothermal vents that are in fact the uh, new forms of energy that support ecosystems that we're now looking for on alien planets. Um, so we have this legal regime that was established in 1982 that was supposed to be for the benefit of humankind as a whole uh, and a new ecosystem, new knowledge about the ecosystem. So for the past five years, there's been growing commercial interest in uh, potential exploitation of the mineral resources there. At the same time, we have increasing knowledge about the vulnerability of the deep sea. There have been research projects in the US, research projects in Europe, uh, and an obligation of the contractors to actually research the potential area where they would like to go. Um, the problem is this exploitation code is a complicated beast and it requires knowledge about how we can actually ensure effective protection of the marine environment. This is something that the negotiators of the Law of the Sea Convention very wisely put as the center point of the Law of the Sea Convention. And so now at the International Seabed Authority, governments are grappling with whether you can in fact mine consistent with this obligation to ensure effective protection. There had been a push for this deadline of 2020 that we're going to adopt the um, exploitation regulations, but I think there's now the recognition that we really don't know enough to open up the doors to a new industrial exploitation of the seafloor. So I think we're going to be seeing much more scientific exploration. We're gonna be seeing um, a call for further workshops and international engagement in these questions surrounding seabed mining. So I don't think we're on the verge of let it go in 2020, but we really do need to know before we go. Right, and we just heard yesterday that a vote that was scheduled for July has been postponed till October. And so we're depending on what would be presented at the October meeting, but maybe you could just help us understand who the ISA is. I know that there is a ISA assembly with 167 members. There is a council with 36 members. There's a legal and technical commission with 30 members and something called the enterprise. So maybe you could just quickly walk through those four institutions just so we have an understanding of who's making these decisions here. Well, the assembly consists of all the state's parties to the Law of the Sea Convention. Most of the power actually resides in the Legal and Technical Commission of 30 independent experts and in the council, which are 36 states who are supposed to be representing an array of interests from those who have invested the largest amount in deep sea bed mining, those who are the largest importers of deep sea minerals, and those who are the largest exporters of deep sea bed minerals. The Legal and Technical Commission with their 30 independent experts 
have the power to make the recommendations to approve applications for deep seabed mining. And this is where the, the money really hits the road, is that their recommendations for approval of these applications, that yes, they have to show they've done environmental baselines, they have to show they have the technical um, feasibility. But these meetings, the legal and technical commissions, still take place behind closed doors. There's no observer access into these meetings. And when they're now dealing with issues of critical concern for humankind as a whole, we need to know that there is sufficient information to make an informed decision. So the structure of the International Seabed Authority was developed in 1982, slightly modified in the 1994 agreement, but it's reflective of so-called 20th century environmental or extraction management, and it has not kept up with the times. Terrific, thank you. And it's just a reminder to those on, on, on the call uh, on the town hall, if you want to send questions, please post your questions. We'll be looking and taking questions as, as, as we come through. Um, so, so Lisa, you know, based on that and you know, what Christina, talk, Christina talked about in terms of um, 20th century um, uh, philosophies or, or value systems and also management tools, what is your sense on how these mining operations will be monitored as their capabilities within the ISA? And, and what are you seeing with other treaties that have emerged? You know, there is a big treaty right now called the High Seas Treaty of Diversity beyond national jurisdiction that has, has an overlap between environmental protection on one side and the extraction of the ISA. So maybe you can talk a little bit about um, the ISA's ability to, to monitor um, what the, the impact of operations and a little bit about the implications of the BBNJ treaty. Yeah, so you really highlighted, Nishan, the diversity of instruments that apply in the area beyond national jurisdiction. So there's one set of rules for fisheries, there's another set of rules for shipping, there's a third set of rules for um, seabed mining, et, et cetera, et cetera. And all of these different uh, regimes are not consistent with each other. Sometimes they conflict and there are differing standards and requirements in each. So the so-called BBNJ negotiations, uh, which stands for only in UN speak, uh, Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction. These negotiations are, are aimed at strengthening the management and conservation of biodiversity in the area beyond national jurisdiction. And uh, as we all know, this the area beyond national jurisdiction constitutes about two thirds of the world's ocean area and covers almost half the planet. So here we have a once in a generation opportunity to advance conservation in half the planet and to bring these differing regimes that have differing standards together in a way that makes it a, more, a much more, co more coherent scheme. So the BBNJ negotiations, uh, as, as they're called, are entering a final stage. Uh, they were, we were supposed to have the last negotiating session uh, it, this past April that has been postponed, which gives us a little more time to make progress. The, the problem that we see is the disconnect between some of the discussions around the development of seabed mining and how that is to be regulated, monitored as you raised enforced, et cetera. Uh, and the, uh, uh, the rules for the same types of things that are going on within the BBNJ negotiations. And so just as an example, the proposed regulations for exploitation in the area beyond national jurisdiction have uh, a very, um, shall we say, primitive approach to environmental impact assessment with respect to public consultation. There are basically no requirements for public consultation other than to report who the seabed talk, mining uh, ISA talked with. That is not consistent with modern practice. Um, similarly, the e, uh, environmental impact assessment procedures in different um, high seas activity sectors uh, are also not even close to what we in the US in most developed and developing countries around the world require. So we're in the process of modernizing and harmonizing a whole range of disparate activities and regulations. Um, it's a, people have described it a little bit like the Wild West. And, and that is uh, where the current effort is to try to bring 
um, some coherence to the whole process, including seabed mining, but not limited to it. You raised monitoring as, a, as an issue, sorry, and I just want to briefly touch, touch on that. It's a really important question because, as you know, people know, the impacts of seabed mining and other activities on the area beyond national jurisdiction can extend far beyond the actual site of the mining itself. So we're talking about potentially a huge area directly impacted by mining. How far out those impacts extend depend on, depends on many different things, including how the mining is conducted, et cetera. But our ability to monitor those impacts is extremely limited. And as we know, we know more about the backside of the moon than we do about the deep ocean. And being able to monitor and be able to tell even what has changed as a result of seabed mining will be very challenging. So, so that's it. So if we explore that a little bit further, we heard from um, Sylvia Earle and Liz Taylor uh, in our last town hall. I see Sylvia's asking a question. I'll get to that question in a moment. But, but we heard from uh, Sylvia Earle and Liz Taylor at the last session that there is going to be an implication with it. it's the sediment plumes that you mentioned, which is the great unknown unknown in terms of where this cloud could, could extend. So at the moment, as currently drafted, um, what is the sense of what the ISA would govern in terms of impact on biodiversity, environmental impact, and what is the overlap with the BBNJ, uh, and what, what sort of species is covered under the BBNJ? Maybe you could talk a little bit about what you mean by harmonizing those regulations. Um, well, Christina should feel free to jump in because she's a big expert on this. I will just say that, um, so just as an example, high seas bottom trawling, which is a fishing practice in which great weighted nets are dragged along the ocean floor and they pick up and destroy whatever is in their path. We decide, the United Nations decided um, back in 19, uh, 2006 to require that bottom trawling be managed to prevent significant adverse effects on the ocean floor or not allowed to proceed. The same standard does not apply to seabed mining. So the seabed mining industry can go out and destroy huge swaths of the ocean floor without any consequence, whereas fishing is subject to much more stringent regulations. That's the kind of disparate uh, treatment of the environment that we're seeing right now. And one of the issues that the BBNJ negotiations is trying to resolve to make make everybody play basically by the same rules. And I would say at the International Seabed Authority itself, we are struggling to make sure that there is a definition that is consistent with what they've done for deep sea bottom fishing, which is to avoid significant adverse impacts. There is something to that extent already in the exploration regulations, but it has never been developed. The Legal and Technical Commission, our experts, were supposed to develop guidelines on how to apply this in the context of exploration, but we don't even have procedures for environmental impact assessment set yet for the exploration phase. So it's unclear how they're going to proceed in the exploitation phase. Some contractors have actually said, how can you mine without causing significant adverse impacts? And this flies in the face of what the United Nations adopted globally as part of the Sustainable Development Goals 14.2 that talks about protecting, conserving marine and coastal ecosystems, avoiding significant adverse impacts, building the resilience and ensuring a healthy and productive ocean. It's difficult to see how you can make up a definition of what is a significant adverse impact that flies in the face of being able to restore, protect, and enhance ocean resilience. Great. And so I'm I looking at the question that Sylvia is asking. So there is a tension between the, uh, those who, but, but between the exploitation uh, or, or extraction of those resources versus those thinking about protection of those, those environments and, and a life there. And Sylvia is asking a question, what impact or influence can ordinary people have on these large rulemaking bodies to help nudge them towards protection versus exploitation. And I think she's mean both the ISA and on the BBNJ side as well. I'll let either of you uh, come in on this. At least it's with NRDC, I'll let her go first. <laughs> <laughs> so um, a couple of things, first of all, individual people need to make their voices heard uh, and at all levels. Uh, and while decision-making takes place at the United Nations, 
the decisions are made by the, the individual countries involved. And those countries are beholden to the most, for, for the most part, to their people. So making your voice heard, letting your political leaders know that you do not wanna see seabed mining take place in the area beyond national jurisdiction because it's too dangerous and we don't know enough is, is a really important way. The other, um, there are other avenues as well. So for example, there is a growing, um, a growing uh, movement towards setting new international targets for biodiversity conservation. Those will be determined at the next conference of the parties of the Convention on Biological Diversity that was supposed to happen this October. Pressing governments to take strong action to set new important targets uh, and, and much more um, aggressive targets can be a very important way to go forward. One of the most important uh, efforts along these lines is um, an effort by a number of countries, NGOs, scientists from around the world to promote the full or high protection of at least 30% of the ocean by 2030. This concept of 30 by 30, it needs to be informed by science. You want to protect areas that are biodiverse, that are rich in uh, species that serve important functions, and not just areas that don't have any minerals in them or don't have any fish in them, which is what uh, we've seen a lot of in the past. So um, a new international goal uh, of protecting 30 by 30 would really be uh, take the ocean a step forward, as will uh, an important, a strong bio, uh, uh, BBNJ treaty that will manage in a much more robust way activities outside those protected areas. Christina. And just because um, IUCN is greatly involved in these discussions, I would say one of the events that's been postponed has been the IUCN World Conservation Congress that was scheduled to go on in June of this year has now been postponed until January 2021. The opportunity there is for members of NGOs, uh, from NRDC to Greenpeace to World Wildlife Fund, to make sure that the leaders of those countries are aware that there is a motion um, that's going to be discussed and potentially adopted at the World Conservation Congress that's directly focused on deep sea bed mining, trying to set forth some parameters for deep sea mining as it proceeds. And the importance of those resolutions is they both help to direct the IUCN Global Marine and Polar Program onto how they conduct themselves at the International Seabed Authority, but also there are many state governments who are part of IUCN as well. There's uh, 200 plus state members, as well as over 850 NGOs who are members of IUCN. So this is like a, a world conservation party, if you will, in Marseille in uh, January, where people come together to really talk about the key issues of the day. There's gonna be public forum, as well as you know these real debate forum to talk about how we want the future of our planet to go. And I would say a big topic there is you know, really nature-based solutions and how can we help to restore the resilience of our ocean through protected areas, through ensuring that activities are in fact sustainable. So, so this is an event that happens once every uh, four years. Um, and so that's, uh, uh, so it really is a, an Olympic. And, and maybe the last one, and then I'll come to some of the questions that I'm seeing uh, emerge over here. Um, it sounds as if there's a little bit of the cart before the, the horse here. If it sounds like we're trying to push forward exploitation um, frameworks at one particular body, the ISA, and yet at the same time in parallel, we're divide, developing various environmental standards in other bodies, whether it's the CBD process you mentioned, the WCC, the World Conservation Congress, or the BBNJ negotiations, even the Paris Agreement that talks a little bit about um, you know, deoxygenation of, of, of the ocean. Maybe just a, a last piece before we turn to questions on um, uh, the sequencing. Does it, does it make sense or should we be prudent here to wait for these environmental standards to be put in place before developing uh, the exploitation framework? works um, or you know, are things fine as they're progressing right now and you, you expect that there'll be a, 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 a seeming resolution there? Lisa first. Okay, so um, 
our view is that seabed mining ought not to take place, period. Uh, it is not, a, 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 we don't need the minerals. We don't need to further add to the incredible weight and burden of human activities that are already having a very significant effect on the ocean uh, it, from a variety of standpoints. It's clear that we have to take action to protect the ocean and not to further damage and destroy important habitats and marine biodiversity. So that we come from that perspective. The, um, I think the key thing is in the BB&J negotiations, um, I, I sometimes think of it as an analogy here in the United States. So we, on federal land, on public land, we don't have the fishing industry setting the rules for fishing and the mining industry setting the rules for mining or their representatives. We don't have different sets of rules uh, that govern the different, different types of activities on public land. All activities have to achieve the same objective, which is conservation and wise management. And so, and that is actually articulated in fairly significant detail. So we're trying to get a more comprehensive regime that brings together all these different activities and subjects them to the same types of requirements so that the we can ensure that the environment is protected and that certain sectors aren't disadvantaged by the activities of other sectors. So Christina, I'm sure you have thoughts on this too. Uh, well, I would agree. I mean, inside the International Seabed Authority, there is a renewed focus on developing environmental standards and thresholds. The challenge is we really don't know enough about the deep sea in order to set any type of coherent or logical standards. And it's sort of not a place you want to go into blindly, where you just sort of go, oops, we better um, adjust the standard now because the, the first impact, the first cut, it's not a cut by death by a thousand knives. It's basically cut by one tractor tra um, trailer that goes through or by a, a caterpillar tractor through a rainforest, as Sylvia would say. Um, and so we don't want different standards for environmental protection to be developed by the International Seabed Authority and yet another set of standards applied by the deep sea bottom fishing industry that may, when both of these standards may in fact impact the ability of the um, regional fisheries management organizations to actually ensure a safe and healthy supply of uh, fishery resources. We've got so many activities out there where they are starting to collide with one another as well as our norms of human health as well as environmental security. Great. And, and we're starting to see some questions. So Timothy asked a question about how do the norms and laws regulating marine protected areas help establish effectively a protection zone on ocean floor mining? And maybe I'd like to ask you to respond to that, but also expand on that because um, the seabed is almost like the Arctic or the Antarctic, where these are very unknown territories. Um, so uh, what are some of the norms, not just in marine protected areas, but what we've seen in other areas of you know, common heritage of mankind, like the, the Antarctic and Arctic, and how we set up about a policy framework to, um, to protect those spaces? Either of you can come in on this. Well, I'll just take a, a stab here. Um, if you look at a marine protected area theory, uh, you know, basically you want a swath of representative areas, and then you want to also be protecting your special areas. The International Seabed Authority has set up a swath of so-called areas of particular environmental interest uh, that are supposed to be representing specific habitat types in the clearing Clipperton zone between Hawaii and Mexico, let's say. This is the size of Europe, and so they're taking a few states here and there that are supposed to be representative, but as Lisa pointed Pointed out, they moved those protected areas outside the areas of mining interest where you have the most nodules. So first you want areas that are actually representative of the habitat types um, that are full, comprehensive, replica replicable. Um, but at the same time, you need to make sure that activities outside your protected areas do not undermine the protection inside the protected right. areas. That's with deep sea bed mining, unlike other activities, we have the potential for a plume that can spread thousand kilometers. That was, and it's not like um, smog that will rain down. This will hang in the water column for 
potentially you know, tens, if not hundreds of years, if they're mining for 20 years, it's not going to go away and it will persist after that. So the traditional rules and approaches to marine protected areas need to be rethought, but rethought from a precautionary extent, you know, to, to what extent do we want mining to proceed in what area as opposed to what areas do we set aside? Perfect. And I'll just, um, just stepping back for one moment, um, thinking about how we use our ocean. It's clear from the IPCC report, from the biodiversity report that came out of the UN and many, many other scientific investigations that the ocean is at a point where there are so many stresses um, exerted on it that it may no longer be capable of pr providing us with what we need to survive as humans. And the ocean is warmer than any time in recorded history. It's more acidic than in the last 14 million years. It's losing oxygen, which is essential to all life. And on top of that, we have fishing and shipping and mining and chemical pollution and dead zones and plastic, rivers of plastic gyres covering massive areas. Do we really want to pose yet another huge threat to the biodiversity and the life in the ocean on which all of us depend? Our view is that this is not necessary that, and that we need to get out in front of this and pause the whole train until we have a much better understanding of the deep ocean and whether seabed mining can proceed ever in a safe way. That is from our perspective, the best way forward. And we're hopeful that um, countries will begin to see that uh, in, the, in the coming weeks and months and years uh, ahead, of, uh, ahead of us as we progress through not just this year and the super year for the ocean, but, but beyond as well. Great. So it sounds if there's, um, you know, especially if there's no urgency for these minerals right now, which as some of the questions we'll come to in a moment, it is important to be prudent. Um, there, there are a couple of other questions. So I'll just take that. I think Pilar's asking me to share the um, overview of the um, institutions. So hopefully you can see them here. And it gives me a chance to answer um, Martha's question. Martha's asking, how are the boundaries established on continental shelves? There's this group over here called the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf that effectively reports into the UN Secretary General, and they set the boundaries of the um, 200 miles. And there's a, a big negotiation that happens right now. Brazil has put a, a big um, bid for a, a, a chunk of area, a territory within the um, South Atlantic. Um, but that's the commission that reviews the um, boundaries of the extended continental shelf. Um, and Can I just step in there? Please, that yeah. was, it's the uh, extended continental shelf boundary that is being determined by the commission on the um, outer limits of the continental shelf. It's not the exclusive economic zone. The EEZ boundary is 200 nautical miles generally from the shoreline. Uh, and that of course can uh, hopefully not change too much, but with climate change and sea level rise eroding creates another problem in the Law of the Sea Convention that wasn't foreseen. Uh, but the extended continental shelf, the delimit, the how to define those boundaries takes a lot of scientific research, a lot of scientific capacity and know-how because it's based on how thick your sediment is and how far out it goes. Um, same um, requirements for deep seabed mining. We have to understand what is actually out there and how it functions and what its gradients are and what lives there before it goes. So it really highlights the, the whole need for a much better understanding of the ocean seafloor as well as the huge array of life that lives between the seafloor and the 4,000 to 8,000 meters above. Thank you for that and, and the depth of science. And that brings me to um, Lam Jahao's question, where, which he asks about how are decisions being taken at the uh, ISA? Effectively, his question is, should the decision to begin seabed mining depend on the availability of metals from land and their price in the world market? Uh, so not just uh, on, the, in, on the ocean sector in themselves. So, so maybe, uh, Christina, first, um, what is your sense on how the ISA should be taking decisions? Should we be looking at the availability of metals on land as well? 
Well, I think that's a, a difficult question that, um, I mean, the decisions at the International Seabed Authority should be taken on behalf of all of humankind, which also includes those who are producing metals on land. Um, we also need to be looking into how we can clean up the metal supply on land. Um, we don't want the decisions to be taken only on behalf of the industry who stands to gain the whole promise behind the uh, International Seabed Authority and the common heritage of mankind was that all states would benefit and developing countries would actually um, benefit financially and economically. But at the, the current rates that the mining companies seem to want to be able to pay, nobody's really going to see a penny. And all we're going to all share are the losses that are left behind for generations to come. So we really need to think about who is it that is taking these decisions? Is it the, the state's parties to the Law of the Sea Convention that are supposed to be, ideally, shedding their mantle of national self-interest and acting on behalf of all of us um, in deciding who is going to be mining? or do we need to bump it up to someplace else where we can deal more effectively, more impartially, if we can, uh, to these questions now that affect global health and well-being. That, so we really do need to start thinking about where should these decisions be made. Just to add to that, um, thinking about, uh, so sometimes there's this false dichotomy that is set up between mining on land and mining in the ocean. And, the reality is I think that argument sells us short in terms of our technological know-how and uh, the ability of the, indust of the industry that in various industries that use these metals to come up with alternatives. So Elon Musk is announcing cobalt free vehicles. Uh, there are you know, lots of ways in which through re better recycling of existing, you know, the metals that are in existing computers and other um, uh, users to, you know, finding alternatives to these metals for uh, what we need them to do. I don't think we should sell our tech industries um, and our science scientists and our um, real um, forward thinking inventors short. I think they're making huge progress and um, we don't need to go out and trash the ocean in, in, when there is this enormous um, reservoir of metals in our existing electronics that we can mine uh, on our, uh, you know, apart from mining anywhere else in land. So I think it's a false choice and uh, I think putting it out there uh, in that way is, uh, doesn't really help advance the conservation or the proper management of either the land or the ocean, so. Right. So effectively, we're both asking for or urging transparency of some of these decisions and transparency of these resources, if, if there really is a shortage. And, and your point about recycling and manufacturers, it comes to another question that Sylvia is asking, Sylvia Earle, about um, should we, could we be urging manufacturers to certify and that the minerals are not coming from the deep sea? And also, can we ensure that there's greater um, R&D to make sure that cobalt should be used less? Um, and so what are your thoughts there and how can we keep that pressure on the demand side of the market? Lisa, over to you. Well, if I were king of the world, queen of the world, I would tell um, the Apples and the Googles and the Musks and the, you know, the industries that use these metals, I would go to them and say, this is not a, 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 a place we want to go as humanity. We don't want to continue to mine these metals at the rates we're mining them um, but anywhere. You are at the forefront of technological innovation. Deploy your technological innovation to helping us mine the recyclables we can mine and shift over to alternatives where we can. I think it would be a really cool uh, project to invite people together, the users together, and, and put them to work on these problems and see if we can't come up with a better solution than destroying the ocean floor. There are activities like hackathons where people are given a problem and say, okay, think of some alternatives, let's come up with some solutions. 
And I think there are already people thinking about sort of the, the, the circular economy for minerals, the circular economy for plastic-free planet. Um, yeah, we have brilliant minds. People are looking at the price of cobalt as in fact, um, because it's so volatile, sometimes it's up, sometimes it's down, that that in itself is reason to limit the amount of cobalt that you actually need and to start looking for substitutes. There are new technologies for mining wastes from old tailings. That, um, so I think we do have the technological know-how to, to be finding these solutions. We need to be inspiring and pleading with our tech brilliant thinkers on how do we actually go about getting the best results that we can using the planet most wisely. I think so. You're both hitting on you know, another important um, theme or trend we've seen in the last five years is emergence of the notion of a circular economy. We don't just need to extract. And so there are new technologies, new processes, new value systems that we're seeing that's encouraging this, this, this circularity and that could help us manage our resource more effectively. I'm getting a question from Carissa um, who's asking which groups of countries are at the forefront of deep sea mining? So could you give a sense of maybe some of the political landscape? Who are the big drivers for seabed mining? Who are some of the countries saying, well, look, we need a, more of a precaution? Um, Lisa, maybe, maybe yourself first. What are you seeing? I'll uh, jump in here, I think. Um, yeah. That's, well, at the uh, International Seabed Authority, you have companies and then you have sponsoring states. So you have to be sponsored by a country in order to get access to an area to explore. Um, but for some reason, some developed countries, um, developed companies like Lockheed Martin or Deme from Belgium or Deep Green have been able to partner with developing countries. And um, so those developing countries of um, Nauru, Kiribati and um, now Tonga are um, advancing theoretically on deep seabed mining. Um, but the, the serious investigators are coming out of uh, Germany and the rest of the European Union where they have been putting money into deep sea scientific research as well as clean production technologies. India and China uh, both have um, exploration contracts in the Clarion Clipperton zone. They've been um, advancing in technologies and exploration. Russia, uh, has some um, areas of exploration. They've been advancing S Singapore, um, of course, the UK seabed resources there. So there's a mix of developed and developing countries, but arguably most of the com companies are in fact from developed com countries. Um, the leaders, I mean, I think it's too early to say uh, how the political spectrum is going to align itself, but I think it's, those countries that don't, um, that care about the ocean, who care about the marine environment, are not going to be the first ones to be putting their hand out to start seabed mining. That's, and so we really need to think about what are the, the drivers for seabed mining? Is it just simply to say, I have a geopolitical interest in a continued supply for 50 years, or is it because we just want to go out and make a profit over the next 10 years? Got it. Lisa, your sense on, on those countries and also with the context of B, the BBNJ as well, what, what are you seeing? The, the world is a little bit topsy-turvy right now in terms of traditional advocates not necessarily being at the forefront, but what are you seeing in terms of countries who are advocating for greater protection versus exploitation? Uh, well, it's interesting. It, it's a great question. Um, so there are uh, countries that are tend to want to uh, leave the existing regimes as they are. So leave the fishing management of fishing to the RFMOs and leave mining to the states that are most interested in mining, um, et cetera. But there, I think there's a growing recognition that in an increasingly busy ocean, we are having conflicts between different sectors and that will continue to grow until there's some way of managing the, them as a whole. So, you know, again, I come back to the example in the United States that the fi fisheries are not managed separately from, uh, uh, are not managed separately or subject to different standards than offshore drilling. And there, there are certain rules that both must follow. That is not the case in the area beyond national jurisdiction. 
um, some the, the standards about what has to be done, how the environment is to be protected, differs among the different sectors. And it doesn't make any sense. That's not what we do here. And that's not what we should be allowing beyond national jurisdiction. But I think that there is a growing cadre of countries that recognize that it, this chaotic situation, if allowed to continue, will ultimately harm everyone, including themselves. And so the, the, there is interest in trying to harmonize and, and, and enhance the conservation and management in a more holistic and integrated fashion. Can I just jump in here with an example of um, the conflicts of use that are increasing with deep seabed mining on the forefront, which is cable laying. Uh, those telecommunication cables that we rely on right now for transmitting ourselves around this planet. That's 97% of our telecommunication traffic is carried by these submarine cables. Um, and they're of course planning more. Well, these need to be sustainable, but areas of seabed mining are now, um, exploration contracts are going atop some of the most logical routes for cables. A cable is the size of a garden hose. A seabed mining plot is the size of 75,000 square kilometers. That, so if you're looking at, um, you know, what do we value more? How are we enriching our planet more at this point in time? Is this by being able to, to see you and practically touch you on these uh, hard screens? Or is it somehow having the screen be made by, you know, something that's not already recycled and reused? Right. And I think you're, you're both hitting an interesting point when, you, when we look at different industries, whether it's on the um, cable laying companies or even the oil and gas companies. I think uh, when we looked at Deepwater Horizon 10 years ago now, the cleanup bill is somewhere of the order of $65 billion. And uh, our understanding from the um, International Tribunal, of the, you know, the law of the sea, is that country states sponsor companies will be financially liable for any damaged causes. So if you're a small country, I think it was a 2012 uh, decision, but any country like Nauru or Tonga or Kiribati who are sponsoring a company, if there was to be any cleanup damage of the order of magnitude we've seen from Deepwater Horizon, um, what will be their fiscal ability and will that be passed into taxpayers in, in those countries? So I think those are you know, important questions to explore. We're getting a, I'll probably take a last couple of questions uh, before we ask uh, uh, Lisa and Christina to close. So Erin Erin is asking a question, um, asking about the value of deep sea corals as sponges for pharmaceuticals, but it's a deeper question, I think, which is what is the value of, of life? And we, are, we know that there are um, commercially attractive um, you know, enzymes and microbes at the bottom of the sea. And how do we balance that with the value of the minerals that we're seeing? So I'll start um, and Christina can jump in. Um, this is a really important point and we are uh, discovering new medicines for the treatment of cancer, of heart disease, of AIDS, and now of COVID-19 from sea creatures. And the deep sea has been so poorly under understood. You know, we there are, again, we know more about the backside of Mars or the moon than we do about the organisms that live in the deep sea. Do we really want to unleash a suite of destroying, uh, of, of complete destruction of these, some of these creatures in the form of seabed mining before we can even understand what they are and what benefit they might have to the broader humankind. So I think, you know, the, the high seas, the area beyond national jurisdiction, it's sort of out of sight, out of mind. People think of it as dead, as Christina said, as really lifeless, but it's not. You know, every time scientists go out there, they come back with species new to science. Some of those species could hold God knows what, the, the cure for cancer or the cure for any number of diseases. So we, in our, it's in our own interest to better understand what we have out there and how it, what role that plays for humankind and for all life on, on the planet before we go out and destroy it. And one of the huge opportunities we have right now is both the, the combination of the UN Decade of Ocean Science as well as the BB&J negotiations, where there's large questions about the sharing of marine genetic resources that may, you know, the, the study may reveal the next 
cure for cancer, but it can also reveal new technologies for understanding what's going on inside your own body. It can also reveal new technologies for uh, imaging things that glow in the dark. Uh, so it's not just about finding the, the next cure, but it's about um, finding ways to utilize genetic resources to better monitor and assess the health of ecosystems, to identify who lives there, who doesn't, what species of sharks have you confiscated in your container filled with shark fins. Um, it's providing us new tools to conserve, to study, to manage, and to enforce our existing laws. And so part of the UN decade of ocean science for sustainable development is going to be focused on how do we expand knowledge, awareness, and capacities in using these new tools, which very handily uh, uh, branches over into the BB&J negotiations, where we're talking about potential value and use of these, you know, little in, you know, particles of DNA that float around in the ocean that um, we can use without using up. Absolutely. So this, this new biological revolution that we're starting to see, and, and we're, we're just on the cusp of that as we've seen from various innovations. I'm getting a question from Stan who asks, um, what would happen um, uh, if or the seabed mining industry has made the argument that if the world doesn't proceed with um, regulations, countries like, he gives the example of China, countries like China would move forward with seabed mining regardless. What's your sense on that? If we don't have regulations, there's companies or countries who will just move forward in a lawless, uh, in a lawless way. Well, I wouldn't say China is lawless. That uh, China is host of the Convention on, Bio um, Convention on Biological Diversity Conference of Parties in now 2021, most likely. Um, I think there's, there's a sense of responsibility uh, a sense of restraint that the global community does value, um, particularly as embodied by the Law of the Sea Convention. The United States is not a party to the Law of the Sea Convention, but yet it is one of the most um, firm supporters of the norms, freedoms, and rights and responsibilities that are um, part of the Law of the Sea Convention. So I don't think the whole thing would dissolve. The Law of the Sea Convention already puts forward some pretty stringent norms and requirements, like national laws are supposed to be no less effective than those adopted at the international level. And if you look at just what Article 145 in the Law of the Sea Convention, it says, ensure you can um, adopt the necessary measures to ensure effective protection. That so we have the ability to work with states to make sure that all these best practices are applied or ideally to discover that we don't need these minerals at all. Um, and we have yet to see most extractive regimes that actually bring back true benefits to the, the countries that need the most. And I would just add that just from a very practical standpoint, if I were an insurer of a company, if I were an investor in a deep sea mining company, and people just were going out, you know, without any kind of regulatory regime in place at all, I would be very reluctant to put my money there and, and grant insurance to a, a body that's going out without any kind of regulatory structure in place. So I, I'm not so worried about that. What I'm more worried about is this, um, this sort of structure that was built in the 1980s, for the 1980s, that conducts most of its work in secret, that is uh, aimed at developing the resource and not at anything else really, uh, it is going forward in an era where we now know so much more than we did. We now know that there are incredible riches in terms of biodiversity in the deep sea. We now know that the ocean is subject to so many different stresses. We now know that the worst thing we can do is add to the stresses by strip mining vast areas of the ocean floor. It's a dumb idea. It's a, <laughs> an idea that was okay maybe in 1982, but here we are uh, in 2020. And I think you know we ought to just look at this idea and say, sorry, it's no longer appropriate. Perfect. With that, we're coming up to the top of the hour. There's so much more to explore. I've seen this, lots of questions about things like, you know, should we call for moratorium on seabed mining and, and in the current political context? I wish we had more chance to explore that. 
We're coming up to the top of the hour. We committed to a, a, a one hour town hall. Uh, Lisa, Christina, um, I'd love to invite you back again to explore some of these topics even further. Uh, I know you'll be available for other questions, but with that, um, let me draw today's discussion to, to, to a close. Lisa, Christina, thank you very much. And please join us for our next uh, town hall. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'd like to thank our hosts, Nishan Degnaran, Christine Jurdy, and Lisa Spear. This was really terrific. This town hall was brought to you by Ocean Elders and Medley Media. And for those of you who have missed it or would like to share it forward, a recording will be available on the Ocean Elders YouTube channel shortly. We'd also like to encourage all of you to join our upcoming town hall in June, but note that the town hall scheduled for next week has been postponed due to the rescheduling of the ISA meeting from July to September. Please follow the Ocean Elders Facebook page or Twitter feeds for updates on dates and times of future webinars. And thanks again for joining us. Goodbye and have a great evening. <laughs>